This episode of Harvey Brownstone Interviews is brought to you by the Harvey Brownstone Talk Show Blend Coffee, available at hollywoodblends.com. Everyone's saying it's the best coffee they've ever tasted. Why not give it a try and see for yourself? Hello, everyone. I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today's guest is a beloved actor who is forever remembered for his portrayal of Officer Jim Reed on the classic TV shows Adam 12 and Dragnet 1967. And he's appeared in dozens of other TV shows, including The Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, Galactica 1980, Unsub, Sequest 2032, Renegade, Silk Stockings, Jag, and Farscape. He's also appeared in many feature films and TV movies, including The Young Warriors, The Outsider, Breakout, Airplane 2, the sequel, Nashville Beat, Return of the Living Dead 3, Tides of War, and many more. And get this, he's the only actor to have appeared in five Elvis Presley movies. He's been heavily involved in the Screen Actors Guild for 40 years, and in 1999, he received the Ralph Morgan Award in recognition of his devoted service to the membership. And in the year 2000, he and his Adam 12 co-star Martin Milner received the LAPD Historical Society's Jack Webb Award for their support of the Los Angeles Police Department. I'm delighted to welcome Kent McCord to our show. Kent, thank you so much for being here. Well, thank you for having me. I'm I'm very appreciative of it. Your original plan as a young man was to be a phys ed teacher and football coach, and then you met Ricky Nelson. Was he the one who persuaded you to become an actor? Well, you know, it it all happened in in such kind of a storybook way. I I was living with a family uh, after high school. My parents had moved 100 miles away from my hometown. And I stayed behind at the age of 15. Uh, one of the things I really credit my parents for is having the faith in me at, at, at 15 to basically be on my own. And I moved in with a family and then another family. And, and when I graduated high school, I went to junior college. I was playing football. I uh, uh, had been living with a man named Mike Hafner, who later became a UCLA Bruin and and uh, played with the Denver Broncos. Uh, but I was with Mike's family. He was at UCLA. He came home one weekend and uh, he said, you know, we're going to get together and play this touch football game. Are you interested? And I said, oh, yeah, sure. And I said, who's going to play? And he said, well, it, it, we're going to play a team that Elvis Presley has, and we're going to be on Ricky Nelson's team. And I went, oh, yeah, Mike, let me know when that happens. You know, so a couple of weeks later, he comes home and he says, you know, the game we were talking about, we're going to play tomorrow. But tonight we're going to drive into Hollywood and we're going to meet Ricky Nelson and we're going to talk plays and stuff and what we're going to do tomorrow. And sure enough, we drove up. I met Rick. And uh, the next day, we met at the Fisai House at UCLA and all caravaned over to a little park in, in, uh, in Bel Air called Deneve Park. And when you look at it, you just can't believe that this event could have taken place in this little park. But we got there in the morning, and a little while later, pulls up a rolls with a couple of Cadillacs, followed with Elvis and all his guys. <laughs> And we get out and we start playing this football game and we played until it became too dark to continue. And, you know, Rick and I became friends basically off of that, you know, from that moment. And I was hanging out on the, on the set and Oz put me to work. And, uh, you know, I started standing in for Ricky and, and, and doing a role as Kent. And, uh, you know, that's the way my, my career began. The thing that happened on doing the Adventures of Ozzy and Harriet, on being on a television show every day, and unlike uh, other situation comedies, family comedies that were shooting three camera, Oz, Oz had the show produced just like a film. You know, so it was made like a film, and it was a five day a week shoot, and you know, it was. It, I, I knew that there was a place in this business that I wanted to be a part of. And I thought, you know, if it's not in front of the camera, then it's going to be behind the camera. And then a funny thing happened. I was over at MGM working on a Mickey Rooney series. And, you know, in those days when you worked extra, the way the business was set up and the Screen Extras Guild 
had this finite number of people who worked. So you were working with people all the time that you knew. And if you watch deep into the background of films, you'll see a lot of people that had, you know, that just had terrific careers working extra in this in this industry. And so I was over at MGM and a in a acting teacher who was on the lot saw me and walked up to me. A man named Vince Chase. And Vince said, introduced himself. And he said, do you want to be an actor? And I said, everybody wants to be an actor. He said, no, I'm asking you, do you want to be an actor? And I said, yes. And he said, then why don't you stop doing what you're doing and start preparing to be an actor? I'll help you in any way I can. And that led to a class at MGM. And, and I was ill-prepared for that class. I, I only attended it a couple times. And it was, I, I think Vince may have thought that I had more training than I had. And he kind of threw me in the middle of a, of a class. And Pat Wayne was in there and other, other actors, you know, that, that had been studying and had some sense of what a technique is and how to prepare and do scenes and things. And so from there, I had been in the Screen Extras Guild, kind of, I, there were like three places where I always worked, and that was MGM and Universal Studios and Columbia. And you would basically, at the end of the day, if you weren't going to be called back, you would get on the phone and go to a phone booth and wait in line with all the other background performers and, and call, you know, central casting or, or Hollywood casting and allied. Those are the casting, extra casting uh, services. And with me, I could call one of those three studios. The, the guy who set up all the, all the work for all the background people. And I would usually have a job before I would have a call central or anything else. And, and what happened was I walked in one morning to uh, Universal and a man named Bob Thompson, who later directed Paper Chase with Timothy Bottoms and Lindsey Wang. Bob Thompson was in extra casting. And I walked in one day. He said, listen, I I'm moving into new talent here at the studio. Would you consider doing a screen test? And I said, sure. Yeah, I'd love to. And so from that came a screen test. And, and so we did our screen test and they signed me to a, to a contract. And, you know, and that's the way that, that, that all of that began. And I wound up staying at Universal for the better part of 15 years. And, and to have a lot, a, a movie lot, as a, as a second home where you could go in the morning and have breakfast and then go watch people like Howard and, and Alfred Hitchcock and haunt these stages, you know, and just watch. And, and then every time you got a chance to, to do a small role, you know, as they were building you towards something, you know, it was just a, a wonderful environment to be a part of. Wasn't paying any money. <laughs> During that period of time, I was bouncing in a bar, making more money than I was under contract at Universal, and and so uh, you know it it you know. But I look back on it fondly. The money wasn't the issue on, uh, in that. It was an issue to make ends meet. So. What an evolution! Now you appeared in five Elvis Presley movies: Viva Las Vegas, Kiss and Cousins, Roustabout, Girl Happy, and Frankie and Johnny. Did yeah. you get to know Elvis very well? Well, you know, the interesting thing was from that football game that we played in uh, February of 1961. Y'all get to be friends. And, and Red West, and Sonny West, and Alan Fortas, and Richard Nolick, and all of us, you know, we wound up, I wound up being... Basic, and I'm not sure 
somebody asked me this question before, were you a request? And I said, you know, I, I could have been because there was a group of people that Elvis was comfortable around and they wound up, you know, we worked, you know, background on those movies and Elvis was just comfortable, you know, with the people who, who he could, you know, that weren't gawking at him. You know, I wound up on those films and, and, you know, Bill was saying, I, I, you know, I can't find you in these things. And I said, I can't find me either, but let me tell you what happened. If you go on and you're working as an extra, if you get established in a shot, an interior shot, and, and now you're, you're at the roulette table in like Viva Las Vegas, and now you're interior, when they wrap that set, you're home. <laughs> if you get identified. And so you... You basically never want to be identified. You want to be a body. You want to be a you know back there where you know nobody can really see you. So I look at a lot of those things, and I've got I've got a copy of Evil Las Vegas here, and I've gone through it with a fine tooth comb, and I can't find it. It was the first location I ever went on. Now, of course, Adam Twelve was created by the legendary Jack Webb. What did you think he saw in you when he cast you as Officer Jim Reed? Well, first of all, you know. Jack was a part of Adam. Well, Bob Senator, who you'll see his credit on on the uh, on the thing, created Adam Twelve, and and the the interesting story about that is that Bob took Adam Twelve to Jack. And he said, "You know, I've got this concept that I want to do. It's about two guys in a black and white." Jack said, "Who in the hell would be interested in two guys in black?" And Bob said, "Trust me." This will work. Now, what had happened with with Dragnet and with Jack, who I loved dearly, and Bob Senator was just a genius, wonderful, great human being. What had happened with Dragnet is, is I'm this young contract player, and they're doing a remake of Dragnet. Jack has come on to the lot. Well, Dragnet was such a monumental show to begin with and the winner of emmys for th i think the first three years for the best drama and, and you know and, and and it was a huge thing in my house my mother used to call jack webb bigfoot because of this wonderful vocal app you know how heavy, heavy jack webb was and so the first time i go in to meet jack and i walk into jack's office and Jack is sitting there behind his desk. And they're going to do a two-hour movie of the week to bring Dragnet back. And I, I'm studying. I've got a technique that uh, we had used in class to look at an idea, look back at the person, say the idea, wait till the person, you know, looks back at you and, and gives you his, his idea. And then you look down, look back. And then the and then when you get into performing, you eliminate the like down looking back. You know what you're going to say, and you, but the reality of the moment. So I've got all this stuff in my head, and I'm this young, aspiring guy. And and I walk in to meet Jack, and there he is, Jack Webb, this guy that was so legendary in our house. And he's he's I sit down, and he's across the desk, and he says to me, "Can you read, kid?" And I said, yes, sir, but I've been trained to look. And he said, F that crap. He tosses a newspaper across the table, his desk to me. He said, read the headline. And I read the headline. He says, good kids, you got the job. Just like that? Just like that. He said, good kids, you can read. You got the job. Jack was a very demanding director, Jack Webb. And... And Jack used teleprompters. And I knew a little bit about tele teleprompter technique because Ozzy used them. They had come out of radio. They knew how to look at a, a word on a piece of paper and make it live. You know? And, and you know, but, but Ozzy was a director, writer, producer, editor. You know, Ozzy was the jack of all trades on the adventures of Ozzy and Harry. He was the arbiter of what was acceptable and what got printed and what got edited and what... You know, and what music and where the laugh track came in. Same thing with Jack Webb. They were the same human being 
in that sense creatively. They both wore penny loafers and gray slacks and striped, you know, shirts. It, 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 but they were the opposite side of the coin. Ozzy never drank, smoked, or cussed. Never demanded out of an actor anything. You know, would would coax you. You know, coach you actually. And 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 Jack was just the opposite. Drank, smoked, and cussed, <laughs> and and demanded, and would give you line readings, and you do it this way. Or, don't, you know, he, he wouldn't accept it. So now we're, I, I'm somewhere in the first five or six episodes when it came back, when it sold, they'd done the two hour. Now it's sold and they're back in doing a half hour dragnet. And I'm hired as a young cop. And, and they're, they're looking for a neo-Nazi who has taken some dynamite and is threatening to blow up a school, I think. Of it. And there's an APV out on, on the suspect. And so I'm playing this young uniform cop for the first time. And, and Jack and Harry are inside of this room where there's a table, where there's a box with the dynamite and there's dynamite missing and they're fretting about how we're going to do this. And I walk up and I knock on the door and I say, Sergeant Friday. And he says, yeah. And I say, Officer, I get character name, but oh, Officer Soto. I'm working the detail down the street. What about it? That APB on the suspect? Yeah, I think we got him. Dum, da -dum, dum. You know, and that's kind of the beats of, of what had gone on. So Jack and Harry were having trouble with the head end of this scene that they were to do that then brings, that I then knock on the door and bring Jack to the front door. And they finally get it and we get the thing done. And Jack says to the cameraman, was the kid on camera when he introduced himself? And of course I wasn't. And, and the, the cinematographer said, no. And so Jack's come to me and he says, okay, this time when you knock on the door, wait until I walk over to you so I can cut in and get a big close-up of your mug so your mother can see who you are. <laughs> and I go, okay. So now we've done this thing, you know, I don't know, a dozen times, you know, and that was huge in Jack. You know, if you didn't get it first take, second take, you know, he was unhappy. So now we've changed the, the pacing of the thing and I'm supposed to hold and and we do the, the thing, roll the camera and and I knock on the door, Sergeant Friday. Yeah. And I he's walking towards me and I say, I'm officer. And he goes, cut. God damn it, kid. Get out there and use your head. Now think, wait until I've walked over to you before you introduce yourself. And I step out on this porch and I go, Jesus, man, do I let this guy get away with talking to me? I better. And so I just kind of suck it up. And, you know, and remember at this point, I'm bouncing in a bar making more money than I am at, at Universal. So, so I just go, okay, now we do the thing. And, and Jack, we, we get the take. Now we're moving in for close-ups. And, and like I said, Jack used teleprompters. And he expected everybody else to use them and to know how to use them. And the, what Jack loved about teleprompters was it, it killed performance, which was the style that Jack loved. His favorite direction to an actor was, don't act, just say that damn lines. Blah, 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 period. There's a period in that sentence. I want to hear it. You know, you wouldn't run a line together. You, you, if, you, if there was a period there, you better stop and then pick up the next spot. <laughs> and so now he moves in and he puts a teleprompter. I'm, I'm where I am now. And, and then I'm looking off to, to two teleprompters. One is Harry and one is Jack. And Jack moves all the way and Harry move all the way around to the right of me. And, and 
So the first thing that happens is we start doing a close-up. And I'm looking at the teleprompter. And Jack replies, and my head cocks where, the, where Jack is standing. He goes, cut. Damn it. Here, I'll, we'll do you. Harry and I will move over here so we don't pull your looker. And now we start doing the scene again. And, and I'm doing my stuff. And Jack nudges Harry. And he says, the goddamn kid's real, isn't he? And I hear that and blow the next line. He goes, God, God damn it, let's get there. But that was the instant Jack Webb fell in love with me. I know it. <laughs> when he nudged Harry Morgan and he said, that damn kid's real, isn't he? And Bob was creating Adam 12 at the time. He was riding around with police officers, you know, and so it was born out of tragedy of a young police officer, Roger Warren, was killed getting out of a car in an ambush in a park in, in North Hollywood. And basically that, that was Bob wrote that night. Uh, and, and that is what, what sold the show. So Bob was doing that at the time that I did this police officer. And then Jack had a three-character show written for me. And it was Harry and Jack and me. And I was a young rookie cop working undercover, accused of holding up a liquor store. And it's called The Interrogation. And it's me coming in and then interrogating me. And again, Jack sends me an onion skin script. It's 30, I think it's 39 pages. I haven't looked at it in decades. It's 39 pages. It's got Jack's writing where he scratched out lines and rewrote lines and did all this. And he said, Don't worry about this kid. It's on the television. And so we went in. I, 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 I had the script that, let's say it was a Tuesday night. And they were finishing up the previous episode. And so I had a Tuesday night. And I went in, and when they wrapped the previous show, we were halfway through that first day. And we did entrances and exits. And then the next day, we did 39 pages. And that was the show. And, and that, by the way, is the, the show that uh, Jack does the What is a Cop speech that got read into the congressional record. Uh, and it's a wonderful, wonderful speech. When Jack died and they gave him his service up at the police academy in Los Angeles, Bill Conrad did that speech. And, uh, and it's epic. It's an iconic speech. Yeah. Now, you've played Officer Jim Reed in four different TV series, Dragnet, Adam-12, The DA, and Emergency. Is there yeah. any similarity at all in the personality of Jim Reed and the real Kent McCord? Well, I think, I, you know, there's the, the, it's the only thing that you can do is you, you depend on your own experience. Well, tell me, the, the legendary director, John Ford, was a huge fan of Adam-12. Yeah. I understand one day he came to visit you on the set. What did he say to you? He came over, his daughter called, and, and a man who was producing our show was a man named Herm Saunders. And Herm got a call from, from John Ford's daughter that dad loves the show and he'd love to come visit and Marty had worked with John Ford on Laundry Line. They knew each other from that. Ford came over and he sat, sat on the set, just off, uh, off the set. I could hardly speak. I mean, I was just in awe of this man. What stagecoach, the original stagecoach, is one of the, you know, the greatest movies ever made. My wife was just saying to me the other day, you know, what are what are your favorite movies? We're huge fans of Turner Classic movies, you know, and I start putting them off, you know, and there's, you know, the searchers, but the first real movie Western that I ever fell in love with was Stagecoach. So what you know, did John Ford say to you? 
Well, he just, he would just say, you know, it was just small talk and everything. He was, I think within a few months, he died. And, you know, so he, he was there with his handkerchief and, you know, his little cigar. And, and he would just kind of growl things. Milner, remember when we were doing, you know, and, and that, that was just the banter. And I went to, I went to Herman and Dennis Donnelly was the direct, was directing. Steve Cannell was our story editor at the time. There's a picture of Herm and Tom Williams, who became a producer on the show, and Cannell and Donnelly and Marty, me and John Ford. Picture I love and cherish. And I went to them. I said, let him direct this scene. Let him, this scene. You know, get him. And I was praying that they would do that so I could say I'd worked for John Ford. You know, I mean, it was just, it was one of those things that the impression of it, you know, is there in my head. There aren't any specifics, I can tell you. You know, it wasn't, you know, uh, a lot of that stuff, I wished, you know, it, it's it's like the football game that we played. Elvis Presley, Ricky Nelson, the king of rock and roll and the crown prince of rock and roll, playing in this little park. And there's no video of it. There's no, there's no video evidence that it ever occurred. Well, thank God we have you to remind the world that these things happened yeah. and that your recollection is so good. It now, was, in the early 80s, you were supposed to co-star with Jack Webb in a new Dragnet series, but Jack passed away before the show could be filmed. That must have been heartbreaking. You know, like I said, I love Jack. And, and, you know, he, he was just a, an interesting, complicated man. Gene Miles, who was Jack's secretary for his entire career, called and said, Jack wants to see you uh, and show you something. And, and Bobby and I went over. He, had, he was over at, the, uh, at Golden Studios. And he had what had been Francis Ford Coppola's offices at that time. And we went in and he showed us this thing that he had he had produced and it, it, it wasn't up to Jack Webb standards, I, I gotta say. And and Jack was he was drinking a little during the day. And Bobby uh, and, and I, Bobby didn't drink because he'd had experience with it and, and got off of it. And and I just didn't drink. And so then we went over to a, a, a restaurant for lunch and we came back. And we uh, looked at, at, at what Jack wanted to show us. And then Bobby left. And I left about an hour after Bobby had left. And I walked out and said something to Jean about, you know, I was worried about Jack. And she said, I don't think it's, you know. And so now about maybe six months Later, Jean Miles calls me and she says, Jack wants to meet with you. And you're going to be really happy. He's, he's just, you know, in great shape. You're going you're gonna to be very, very happy to see. So uh, we, I go over to a restaurant called the Cock and Bowl. It was right across the street from where Jack was living at the time. Louis L'Amour is sitting in the table next to us. And Jack introduces me and everything. Then we sit down and Jack says, listen, youngster, this is what we're going to do. He says, we're going to redo drag. And he says, this is going to be your show. And this time, Freck is going to be your, he called Marty Freckles. He's going to be your partner. And he says, I've got, look at how many, I think 400 plus episodes of best goddamn written stuff that's ever been put on paper. The Dick Breen era Dragnet television show. Dick Breen was a brilliant writer. And he said, we're going to update them. I'm going to do the voiceover narration on them. And this is going to be your show. And I said, I'm, I'm in. And we finished having lunch. We walked out. And uh, there was a, he was he was valet parked, and we stood under the little portico that they pulled the cars up, 
we said our goodbyes, our love yous, and kissed each other on the cheek. And two days later, I'm asleep and my phone rings. And Buddy Hackett is on the phone and says, Kenny, you awake? And I said, uh, I'm in bed. And he says, sit up. Are you sitting up? And I said, yeah, I'm up. He said, turn on Channel 7. Jack Webb is dead. I'm in the and I turned on the television. And they were just bringing Jack's body down from the CR Towers. And that was the end of that. What a shame. It could have been so great. Now, you appeared in five episodes of Rowan and Martin's Laughing. Yeah. <laughs> can, can you share any memories of that experience with us? Well, I, I can tell you that we had a lot of fun, that none of that was planned. Uh, for those of your audience out there who are watching this, who go on, I guess, YouTube or somewhere, in, or, or Laughing is available. All the episodes of Laughing are available and find those. Uh, I know this for a fact. We did episode one of season five and episode one of season six, and then some stuff that I had even forgotten about. But Marty, we went from Universal working the day over, over to NBC to do that. And at that time, Marty was living in Falden, which is like a hundred miles away. And Marty wanted to get home. And I had this tendency every once in a while to get the giggles. <laughs> and, you know, we'd look at each other and I'd just start, I'd just blow it. And and that happened. And, and so they would go, okay, uh, let's do it again. And it just kept happening. And then they decided to leave the whole thing in on those, on those episodes. And the year later, the same thing happened. I, I don't know what the what the you know the feather that tickled my my you know fancy was, but it certainly did. And and both of them are fun to look at. I had never really seen Laughing in its original incarnation. They were on Tuesday night at ten o'clock. We worked every Tuesday, uh, you know, every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and every other Friday was our shooting schedule for Adam Twelve. I wasn't up at 10 o'clock. I had to be up at five o'clock in the morning the next morning. And and so I had never really seen it. And then during the pandemic, it was, you know, catch up on old stuff. You know, we're locked in. And all of a sudden there's all hundred and I think it's 144 episodes of laughing. I said to my wife, let's watch these. And so we started streaming these from the from episode one all the way through. And and you know, and then you know, we'd pop in. I say, I forgot that we did that little bit in that one. And, you know, and, you know, I, I knew the two because I looked them up on IMDb, by the way, which is another is another, you know, interesting, an interesting thing that has happened with IMDb. Well, yes, think, because that's how we can find everything yeah. any actor has done. Yeah. I mean, uh, in fact, when I went on IMDb and I saw you wrote, produced, and starred in this great TV movie called Nashville Beat, 1989. Yeah. You were back together with your old pal, Martin Milner. You teamed up with him again in 1997 in an episode of Diagnosis Murder. Right, yeah. What, what do you think it was that accounts for that amazing on-screen chemistry between you and Martin Milner? Well, I, you know, Mari was just such, I've been so lucky in all my life in all my life in this industry, beginning with Ozzy and Harriet in the set that was there. When I got when I went on the show, they'd already been doing they'd already done nine seasons. And it was mainly the same crew. And so it was family. And then I go into this family situation where it is so comfortable, where you know, where everybody was comfortable with everybody. And it kind of set a standard that that you wanted to have. Marty had the same sense of crew as family and having come off of Route 66 and, and the films that Marty had done, what a career Martin Milner had. Uh, was know, he kind of like your brother from another mother? Yeah, yeah. He was like an older brother to me. He yeah, was, it really, really showed. 
Now, you often portrayed a law enforcement official in the TV shows and the movies you made. Did it ever bother you, Kent, to be typecast like that? Not really. Better than not working. <laughs> I can tell you that. You know, I want to jump to something for a second because we're talking about this. This is this is behind me is a, is a picture from a, a, a movie called Seven Days in May. And in to, to my, where am I? You can see me there. And that's Frederick March. So that movie, by the way, every American should look at today. Everyone should look at it anyway. It's just such a incredibly well-crafted film and so well done. And with performers, you know, Burt Lancaster, Kirk Douglas, David Gardner, Frederick March, one of the greatest of all time. But anyhow, again, in those days, those were the fun things of being on a movie set and seeing all these, you know, wonderful, legendary performers. Well, oh, you really sure did. Well. You've done, uh, you've demonstrated amazing versatility. In 1993, you starred in a horror comedy movie, Return of the Living Dead 3. Yeah. Even though you still played a man in uniform, Colonel yeah. John Reynolds, yeah. That movie was still quite a departure for you to be making a horror film. Did you like it? It was interesting. Uh, Brian Usna, who had, who had done uh, Honey, They Blew Up the Kids or something. This was his first directorial thing. But a, but a man who I admired a lot and would see a lot, Clue Gulliger, had done Return of the Living Dead 2 or 1 or one of those. And I thought, you know, this is another area where, you know, you, you, you hope on these things that, that that something clicks that then leads to other things and that's you know you you, you take uh, you know work in and i and i knew the people who were sitting outside the room to go in and meet the director and the producer and audition for the role were my contemporaries and i knew if i wasn't going to get it one of them was <laughs> and so you know i of course you know would have would have uh, you know I, I was happy it was me you know but you know, when you're in this business and and you're going from show to show, like, you know, I had the great advantage uh, of being at Universal for all those years. You know, so from the time I was 24 until I was almost 40, I was at Universal Studios. I had a, I had a permanent room there. You know, it was it was just one of those things. You, well, you earned it. Let's face it. You earned it. You're a good, good actor. I think one of your most interesting performances was in Farscape, where you had a recurring role as Jack Christian. You played two yeah. versions of the same character, one human and one alien. That must have been quite a challenge. Well, you know, the the, the, the funny thing, I had, I had done Sequest, and I got to work with one of the, you know, again, you know, talk about luck. Roy Scheider. You know, he, what a what a incredible guy, you know, he was. I'm doing an episode where I crash into the ocean and he and I are supposed to be contemporaries. And he he chose underwater, I chose space. And and we're we're on the on the back lot at Universal in a tank, wet tank that's filled with water. And, I, and it was January, and it is so cold on the back lot at Universal. It's one of the coldest spots in Southern California. And he shows up to do his offstage lines for me. He didn't need to be there. You know, script script person could have easily done those things. I'm in a tank. They're filming me in a tank. He's sitting in a, in a director's chair, mic'd up so that he's in my ear. It would, you know, and, and that's the kind of professionalism that that doesn't uh, it doesn't always translate. You know, there are a lot of people who would ah, I'll be home, wife and my daughter, and and uh, but that wasn't that wasn't that man. So that that group was a man named uh, that, that did sequest was Rockne Sopan and a man named David Kemper, who's a dear friend, and and I'm home in bed one night. And Kemper has said something now a few years before about they're developing a, a space show, you know, and, and uh, you know, I'd like to see you on it. 
And I went, oh, sure, great, thank you. And so, you know, uh, I'm, I'm asleep and the phone rings at two o'clock in the morning. And I answer the phone. He says, McCord. I said, yeah. He said, Kemper. I said, David, what are you doing? He said, I'm in Australia. He said, you doing anything this week? I said, no. He said, do you have a valid passport? I said, yeah. He said, you want to come down to Sydney and play dad in this show that I told you about a couple of years ago? I said, absolutely. He said, okay, go back to sleep. We'll call your agent in the morning. <laughs> and so that morning they call my agent. We make the deal. I'm on an airplane that night. We start the next day. And so, you know, my boy is shot into space and I'm left on earth and now everything's going to be out there. And I go, well, that was nice. I'm gone from Hollywood, home in Hollywood for 105 hours. So anyway, it's, it's left with that. And then a few weeks or a month, maybe later, Kemper calls. He said, we figured out a way to get you back. You're going to be an alien. And I said, great. <laughs> now I'm, I'm there for the, you know, off and on for the run of the show. There was a tremendous performance. I have to ask you, Kent, you married your high school sweetheart, Cynthia, in 1962. You're one of the few Hollywood stars who's had a long, stable marriage. What's your secret for staying together all these years in an industry that very few people survive? Well, I, I mentioned my teacher, Peyton Price, my friend mentor and he was he was an incredible psychologist as well as teacher and philosopher but Peyton used to say you know for those of you you know who are in relationships you have to remember to educate each other because you either grow together or you grow apart and so he used to feel when he would start his classes, Peyton would do a series of, of lecture, five lectures over five different nights. And it would be about the film form, about the, the human anatomy, about the brain, about the, all these things that led to what it is that we do and what we are then, you know, immersed in when you're creating a, a character. So do you credit him with helping you keep a strong marriage? Well, I, I, I credit that I took it to heart. You grow together or you grow apart. And, and he, he, in that early, that early formative stage, brought in all the wives and girlfriends and put them through the lectures. So this is what your husband, what your, your, your other partner are going to be going through. This is the journey. You know, and so, you know, I, I have this wonderful, wonderful woman who who we we started dating in 1958. And, and so, uh, you know, we uh, we we've had this this journey we've been on, you know, it is is something that we still have fun with. <laughs> you know, she's she's, you know, everything. Everything that you know a person could want, you know, uh, somewhere somewhere in the way, I was reading something, and then with the internet now, you you put in your name, and, and they say, and there's just very little ever said about uh, Kent McCord's wife, you know. Well, she was Miss Baldwin Park. She was a song leader at school. She was Miss Baldwin Park. She was Miss San Gabriel Valley. She comp competed in the Miss California contest, and you know, she she probably and she made her screen debut on The Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet holding our our daughter in an episode of, of the, the Adventures of Ozzie and Harriet. You know, I get the impression talking to you, Kent, you are filled with a lot of gratitude. You're a very happy guy who's very content. You're at peace. There's a certain serenity about you well, that's re quite refreshing. You've spoken several times about the luck you've had in your career. But surely you do realize that a lot of your success was because of talent, not just luck. Well, you know, it's it's preparation too. 
you know, the old Boy Scout model, be prepared, you know, and, and preparation. So when, when a door opens, you know, you can, you can step through it. The, you know, the, there's, there's interesting disappointments that come along the way. You do certain things in this business, you know, offers you so many, so many chances and to have been able to have the career that, you know, when you look at the career people and you, you go back and you go in your, your history and you see the talent that you, you were in rooms with, you know, studying and, and, you know, and you go, wow, you know, there were really, really good actors who just didn't get that one little that lights the fire that gives you a career. You know, and, and so, you, you know, all of these years you're able to look at and, and you know, and just, you know, it's a, it's a, not an easy business to have attained, to, to have made a career in. With so much longevity. Well, you know, when I, when, you know, we're looking at uh, 63 years now, you know, and, and one of the things I, I, I did a thing called, Starfield, a game that is out, that has been a big game. And I called a friend of mine. I said, I just I just worked on my A card, my screen anchor skill card now for the, this was last, it, it went over a period of two years that they were doing this thing. And I was under a non-disclosure agreement. You couldn't talk about it. I couldn't even talk about it with my kids. I go into a studio, they'd give you the slides, you do the voice and you do all the thing. And then the thing finally comes out. And I call a friend of mine and I say, you know, I, I've now, I've worked in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, the 2000s, the 2010s, the 2020s now, and, you know, and uh, on my A card, you know, and I said, so <laughs> I'm pretty happy about that. Well, I got to tell you, it's been a real thrill meeting you. It's been a wonderful opportunity to have this chance to talk with you about your career. I'm so grateful that you agreed to grant me this interview. And I thank you so much for being on our show. Well, I, I thank you very much. And I've had an opportunity to look at some stuff that you've done with like Stephanie Powers and, you know, people, you know, that, that we have interacted along the way. And, well, uh, it was a wonderful experience having you on the show. And I thank you very, very much for taking the time to be with us. Well, thank you. Appreciate Our guest has been the wonderful actor, Kent McCord. My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to my producer, Steve Silver, my director of programming, Robert Monaghan, my PR directors, Eileen Shapiro and Jimmy Starr, and my entire team at the XPTV1 network in the UK. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Thanks for watching. Be sure to check out all the great interviews on the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. Don't forget to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified when new videos are posted.